Okay. All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, Good morning. My Good morning. Name is Hello. And I'm glad to be here. I, this is going to sort of be a, a two-speed presentation. Uh, I don't know the slides. I literally just wrote them an hour ago. Uh, but the, the content is coming from a few different background areas, which I think are useful for a lot of people. Um, I was interested in seeing how we can further expand the great work that all of you are doing into areas where we as a consultancy are exposed and have the great benefit of trying to develop and bring to uh, a lot of users. And, and for that, I, I wanted to, to expand on some of that. Um, one of the things that uh, Matthew said in his, in his presentation rang very true to me. He said that all these mega corporations have a ton of information and access to all of that. And, very recently, a non-technical friend of mine said something to me that I thought was absolutely hilarious. Um, what we know is that Google knows tons about us. Interestingly, Amazon knows how much we want it. And uh, the, 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 the joke she told me, without thinking really of it as a joke, she said, my favorite game on my phone is Amazon because it knows me very well. I play it all the time, and I get prizes all the time. <laughs> and, and when you think about that, it really sort of relates to the relationship that people have with their applications from the device perspective. 95% uh, of the time that people spend on their phone is spent within applications themselves. And that's a, that's a huge amount of time that, that people are leveraging that and they're making use of uh, in their environment. I was looking at even us here in, in this room, people are on their phone uh, almost as much as we're on our computers here, and we're the worst audience possible, right? So when you think about that, it's it's quite significant um, that, that we would even have that here uh, in this environment. So, um, like I said, these are some of the technologies we work on, and um, and the point with this particular slide is the fact that um, you can embed video inside of LibreOffice, um, and you've been able to do that for over 12 years. I was just looking at the Git repository. It's 2004, early 2004. It's cross-platform. It's uh, working on, on, and yet nobody uses it. Uh, and we can think about why or how and, and the reasons for it. And one of the ones I personally think is people don't trust that it's going to work. People think that um, there's going to be issues with it. And these are some of the quotes I came up with myself of thinking, if I ask people, are, are you going to use that? It's probably going to be. Um, it's just not going to work. It's just not going to be packaged properly, or it's not going to read my file correctly, or I, I, I probably don't have the content in the first place. But what I thought was interesting is, um, on this Fedora 23 machine, I haven't updated yet, um, it just worked. I, I was able to use the LibreOffice package that was delivered by the Fedora project, and with the GStreamer plugins that were there, I was able to use the video that I wanted to use. Yeah, Actually, that's not entirely true. Um, I was able to do all the playback. I wasn't able to make the file in the first place. So the issue with video content is you have to make the video content in the first place, right? Uh, it's not like you can, that they're readily available. So uh, when I woke up this morning, I was like, what the hell am I going to talk about? Um, and, and I thought, well, there's got lots, uh, lots of, of great uh, projects out there that gives us great user experiences in open source applications that are very rich. I use Inkscape almost every day. I use the GIMP almost every day. I use LibreOffice extensively um, because I don't have a choice. Uh, and there are some of them that just don't work. So when I, when I started, um, Actually, it was true last week, not this week. I, I wanted to use KDN Live to make the video editing because I tried PTV and that was even worse. I'm not going to go into that. Uh, but I knew I could do what I wanted to do, which was literally a 15-second clip that you, sleep you saw earlier. Um, but the packages were busted. It's not the Fedora project fault itself. It's just the RPM Fusion packages that were there just weren't working on the specific version of Fedora 23, which is very stock. It's a basic machine. I'm a basic user. Uh, so I was able to do it. So that was my user experience when I tried it. And if I didn't dig any further, that's about as far as I would have gotten to be able to show you a video today because that's 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 as far as you get. I had to, I didn't count, but I had to build from source about 12 projects. I had to download about, uh, I would say, short of 100 uh, dev packages for various KDE projects. And uh, after maybe an hour and a half, Okay, I'm not that basic of a user, but after about an hour and a half, I had the project up and running, and it was actually building, and I was able to do that. And case in point, that's the screenshot from this morning. That's the video I showed you. I made it very simple. The content is there, and it was working. So yes, we have applications. They're great. 
Um, they, they deliver uh, the functionalities that users come to expect. Packaging, we know, is a problem, and getting them in their hands is a problem, and then keeping them running in their hands is a problem. And I'm not going to talk about safety or privacy or, or even security. I'm, I'm just now talking about getting the app in their hand and, and, and them realizing that our documentation sucks, you know, um, getting to that point. So uh, I, 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 I was able to get the application working and, and making it integrating. And it was a true challenge. I had not put a video in the LibreOffice Impress presentation in about 12 years since the last time I've actually done it. Um, but it works. So the user experience is critical for people. The experience that they get from their apps is critical. People want to get the experience as a whole. It's not just the application itself. It's not just, it's, it's the whole thing. Um, I, I'm always blown away by how many uh, unboxing experiences people put online. Like, they love the experience of even just getting their consumer electronics product. Like getting it out of the box is a big thing. When we showcase the endless products that we we use when we do a trade show, we take the packaging with us. We we show people the packaging as part of it because we think it's part of the experience of, of the consumer electronics products that you get. And we do that with a bunch of other products that we work on. Um, and something we sort of I think we can admit as ourselves as a large community, something we sort of fall short of in terms of meeting people's expectation as a whole. Um, so because of that, you look at some of the companies that are doing a great job at that. They didn't stop at just thinking of taking an operating system, a distribution in our case, a Linux distribution, getting it working, integrated, and then just delivering it and thinking that by putting uh, Tux Racer and Billiard GL and a standard copy of LibreOffice and a web browser that performs very poorly on the silicon that they're using, it's going to work. That, that's not what people expect from electronics. Even people that don't really have uh, technical expertise from that perspective. So we, we can't fall short of that. And I think that that's one of the things that Endless did very well is they, they've extended all of that. And I think that Valve with SteamOS did a great job as well. And it doesn't just stop at the first boot experience, you know, taking a couple of bits, putting it, making it look a little prettier. It's the overall experience. Another shout out is the fact that the user experience is critical. But I think one of the places where we are even worse is the developer experience is even more critical. If we can't get people to embrace the ways that we make our applications, not only make them, but they end up being publicized and distributed, is a big challenge because we're not going to get them. So we need to make the developer experience beautiful. We need to make them enticed and interested into using it, not just joining communities, but, but delivering great software, beautiful software, beautiful software that they want to use. And that starts with giving them a good platform uh, to develop from and to be able to package into and to do all of that. Makes sense, right? It's logical. It's just something we just haven't really done and we're starting to do that. Thank you so much for that. Um, so if we want to reach beyond, we need to figure out where the demand is. And I'll take you into a very small journey of what my personal experience was over the last few weeks. I'm taking a boot from your page, Federico, which is not talking about technology at all. I'm not going to talk about sidewalk gardening or anything like that, though I'd love to be able to do that. That's still one of my favorite talks. Um, real estate applications on mobile app and phones are extremely uh, diverse in the North American market. I'm just in the process of buying a house myself. And I was talking to a lot of friends of mine, and they were saying, oh, you should use this app, or you should use that app, or you should use this app. And, and so I did. And they were all terrible. Uh, they still are terrible. And one thing I noticed is most of my friends that had the buying power to buy a house had an iPhone or an iPad. And they were using those apps on iOS. And they were telling me how great those apps were for them. And I was using the same app just not on the same operating system. So when somebody tells you the Redfin app is great, they're an iOS user. Because on Android, it's pretty lame. Um, it, sure, it's the same listings. It's using the same databases. The pictures are the same. The dimensions of the houses are the same. They have the same number of bathrooms of them. But I'm being told they have the same number of bathrooms. So that's not what makes the difference. What's really different is the user experience. The fact that when I'm looking for a place and I get 20 listings, I can go through those 20 listings with one user experience on one platform and a rather radically different experience on, on the other one. And from that perspective, the Android user is a very second class citizen in that case. The application experience that you get 
is just not as good. I'm not criticizing Redfin in particular. It turns out it's one of the better ones. It's the one that I was using. But StreetEasy, Easy, Trulia, Zillow, and, and many of the others are suffering from the same thing. They know where their demand is coming from. So when they're hiring developers, they're catering to the user design, etc. I I assume, I don't know, I assume that they're just spending more money and more time and more resources on on, on the iOS potential users. And that, I thought that was interesting. Now, fast forward a few weeks later, because with the whole house hunting things being hopefully behind me, I had to find a freaking car, which I hate the idea of having to find a car. And there I noticed something really interesting. The gap is narrower. The number of people that can afford a used car and have an Android phone is a lot higher than the number of people that have an Android phone and that can buy a house in New York. Okay. Um, and, and as a result, the autotradercars.com, CarMax, and all the other ones that I had the chance to compare between an iOS device and an Android device, the gap was a lot smaller. People cared more. They made better apps. It turns out that if you're riding in the subway in New York City, people have Android devices or they have older iPhones. They don't have the latest and greatest and so on. And it was kind of an interesting realization for me. The market all by itself figures out what apps goes to what users and it sort of make, makes itself happen that way and we need to grow ourselves into getting our apps into the hands of more users and getting them out there and, and pushing them forward so that's sort of the point i wanted to raise is that if we if we constantly, constantly just cater to ourselves and sure i can get KDE in life working on my computer but do we care? Is that the target? Uh, definitely not. It's just we need to think bigger. So this is how people consume their apps today. Let's just be completely frank. That's just how people consume their apps today. In our markets, we need to expand that. If you look at the numbers, 2.2 uh, .2 million apps on the Apps Play, uh, 2 million apps in the Apple Store, and so on and so on, uh, 250,000 still in the BlackBerry Store. Don't ask me what those are. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but that's just a, a quick example of of the sheer numbers, most of those suck. Most of those are worse than, than our apps. But the point is more, somebody tries to put them out there and, and tries to, to, to move them. We need to do the same thing. We need to get the exposure. We need to get the visibility. And, and by raising the awareness is where we're going to generate the demand. That's the most marketing-centric thing I said today. Um, these are some other of our apps that exist today. Um, Medical devices are using GTK. We, I know that for a fact, and, and they're delivered. The problems in terms of delivering the app, securing them, packaging them, and all that exist in that form factor as well. Anybody ever uses a keyboard and a mouse in that specific device? God, no. Um, those are you know special treated monitors and all that, medical environments and so on, et cetera. Um, another form factor, which I'm going to talk about next, is in the cars. Um, obviously, the car I'm buying doesn't have applications in it. Um, because I don't want to or I can't afford it. But uh, people are now getting really for, for, for real uh, application stores and apps in, in their cars. You can expand the functionalities of your vehicle with applications in your car. Um, right now, this is sort of what the experience looks like. <laughs> And, and these are the various stores that exist today. Um, I was surprised, even though I've been working in the industry for a little while, Ford apparently has been working with Microsoft for over six years, and they've had the concept of installable applications for that long. So the, the, the Ford Sync product actually had AppLink for production vehicles back in 2012, if I'm not mistaken. It's really interesting. These are all different ones, and, and my joke still stands. Every single one of those will have some form of a weather app. Um, I think that General Motors was very highly anticipated and all that. They launched their app store, and I think literally at lunchtime they had three apps. Want to guess what one of them was? Um, <laughs> all right, so um, the, the demand is there, and I'm not talking about the user experiences of being able to integrate your phone, iOS or Android or others, inside the car. These are literally the car vendors, the OEMs not wanting to relinquish the control of the driver and the passengers, and they want those application experiences to be delivered by the edge unit, by the car itself. So the application run exists and is connected from within the car. So with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change a little bit the context of what we're talking about, and I'll give you some example of specific use cases. Well, they're not that specific, sorry. 
that's the mistake that the automotive industry has been making for a while and they're learning just like many other verticals they're thinking that they're specific automotive use cases they're just requirements turns out we meet most of those already um, we just need to tell them they need to hear that the visibility needs to increase um, so that so that there is no overlap and no uh, pocket innovations where it's being re reinvented and redeveloped there so um, at a very high level here are some of those examples um, first of all uh, the concept of an app in of itself is a difficult one for everybody to agree upon because we may be talking about different things um, it's either something that that you can launch like a, an app is the icon that shows up on your phone that, that that's sort of an app right or a launcher in a free desktop that desktop uh, xdg definition however that's called uh, or it's the actual user installable bundle so which which one are we going with um, it, it's two different ways this is funny because when we were trying to standardize that as part of the one of the open source automotive uh, organization that we work with uh, we couldn't even get past that point we can get people to agree on whether the app was the thing that you can launch or uh, whether it was the package that you would deliver to them and a long way to go no, long long way to go um, but if it's an installable bundle uh, sometimes you'll have more than one entry point multiple entry points why is that relevant how do you deal with that interaction in the car because you have a very limited screen and more importantly the number one thing you care about is driver distraction the last thing you want to do is overwhelm them with dozens of icons and, and user interactions and multiple entry points that, that are not necessarily relevant for them. So you need to be very careful about controlling how you do that. So the expansion is, does your app really need to have a UI and a launch entry point that user interact with or, or not? Because maybe it could just be a background service. In the case of automotive, you may be able to enrich existing applications by developing your app and just feeding that into that. Um, basic examples of that would be a, a background service for uh, your special location and you want to know what the best uh, gas prices are at the gas station around where you are. So you could add that and the level of application integrations and APIs that would need to be there for the basic navigation application to be able to display that is the type of things that certain car OEMs and platform vendors there are trying to provide. So your app may not be able to have its standard GUI, but you still want to be able to do, do that commercialization, delivery of services, and, and all of the various, various reasons to do that exist in the background. So if you have a GUI entry point, it could be one of any of those. Um, you may be interested to find out that BMW Connected Drive existed for quite a while now. I can't remember when it was first introduced. And they have document viewers in there. You can, you can load a Microsoft Office file, you can open a PDF from your head unit. Um, you know, sure, sure, why not, why not? Um, but um, so, so somebody figured out in, in, in Germany that, that that was a good idea and then you would need to be able to do that. The user experience, not so great, um, but it's there. It's, just, it's, it's a feature that the vehicle has. Um, we're not talking about just reading your SMS messages or being able to display a notification for your emails. They're just literally things that I think over the years we've been doing pretty good on free desktop standards. You know, the ability to open a document and launch it properly, identifying the right application for it, whether we rely on, on map types or whatever other technologies we have there. These are things we do pretty well. And from our perspective in the automotive world, we just need to be able to translate that. And again, let them know that those standards or specifications exist and we can leverage those, whether they have a UI or not. Again, if you're just a, a background data sharing service uh, for the automotive industry, that's a very likely use case. We just need to have a way for them to package that. And again, when you deliver your bundle, not necessarily your app, um, do you have the ability to, to implement those changes from an executable that's the same one as, as the one that has the GUI or a separate one? You start to see where I'm going with this. We're, we're talking about the policies around which the applications can be packaged and delivered. Whether or not you deliver the security as part of it, you need to split them up, you can consolidate them. How big are they? What's coming with them? How many dependencies can they shove inside of themselves? You know, the whole runtime versus non um, library medium and so on. Um, again, that's not something that's been clearly defined there, but it's something we can help them with. I guess it's a plea for help to basically carry that message out and get them to know that we're doing some of that. Talking about App Store policies, 
uh, they want to, some, some vendors have expressed to us that they want an app specifically that only has one entry point. You can only have one icon, you can only deliver it that way. If I am not mistaken, that's something that the Apple App Store does. I don't know for a fact, but I'm pretty sure that's the case. That restriction doesn't exist on, uh, on Android or the Google Play Store. There are very few apps, but there are some, for example, the gigantic IBM navigator type services. You install one APK, you end up with like 50 icons added to your system, and you wonder what happened to your phone. No, seriously, you do. Um, <laughs> So, so yeah, so that's that's type of restrictions. So you know, you're gonna have that. There are people that are gonna be able to constrict at uh, the vendor's perspective what kind of uh, uh, solutions they'll allow in their application store, and and that might have implication to the app developer and the uh, people that package them, test them, validate them, and enable them to be uh, published to the actual store. Another example of that is um, the number of the. Um, uh, executables, and, and those could be very many different things. I'll talk about that briefly on the next slide, but uh, whether you have GUI or not, if you have an, uh, a background service or not, it's, uh, that's something I'm sure you guys are dealing with from your perspective, whether it's web-based or not, there is a bunch of other services underneath that do that. The Apache service from Debian was the one you're looking for. <laughs> the others, not so much. Um, and you want to be able to prevent that, right? So. When you're looking at what we mean by apps, could be very many different things. It could be C, C++, uh, 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 GTIP languages, it could be interpreted more and more. We're talking about the inherent security of the language that you're using for your app, whether or not uh, that's a parameter that some people would some at some point limit uh, is a possibility. Ask that either you, throw, or you show that you use some specific uh, uh, language protections or reviews and all that. We have customers that we as a consultancy are starting to impose that on us. They, they're saying that we need to run through certain code check processes and validations and we need to show them what we've done to make sure that the app doesn't have very basic uh, security or vulnerability issues uh, in them. Um, more and more uh, in the automotive industry is, is looking at HTML5 as a way uh, primarily um, to have uh, access to more developers. They don't really think that it's a great technology. They don't think it's better than native. They don't think that it's just that the talent pool to get beautiful, well-designed applications is, is, is more easily available there. Coming back to the developer experience being just as important, if not more, than the user experience. If you don't get the guys or the ladies to write the apps that look good, that will match the overall experience, you don't have an experience to begin with. So that's where uh, those are coming from. All right. The bundle metadata itself, because I've made that distinction, uh, look at what's going to be published. And, and I recently read a, a blog post by one of you guys around GNOME software itself and, and how that experience came to be. And I, I think that the, the specifications that Freedesk stops, where the idea for the name of the talk came from, is really quite good. It's part of that experience I'm talking about, not just about the technical challenges, but delivering something that people will embrace will feel comfortable that the level of details and, and information is there for them uh, for those various things. Uh, interesting aspect around app permissions, we'll, we'll talk about security a little later. The concept of asking people for the permissions up front versus as they go is something that even Google has struggled with. For those of you that use more recent versions of Android, you'll have noticed that they've actually changed that quite drastically. Um, and it's, I personally find it quite invasive that they interrupt the flow of the user with their application to put the prompts for security permission capabilities, functionalities the apps are requesting uh, in real time. So if I'm using um, um, uh, Telegram, which I installed last night to join the channel for the conference, um, I didn't really want to use the app, so I restricted it as much as I could, and every time I did anything, uh, it would prompt me back for access to my contacts, or it would prompt me back for various security uh, uh, extension accesses that I had refused the application from the first place. Uh, back a long while ago, you weren't able to do that. The only option you had is if you wanted to install the app at installation time, the installer on Android will show you all the permissions, the application, or capabilities that the application wanted to have access to when you either said yes or you didn't install the app. Afterwards, you could go back and manually change those, but that was the installation experience. So there is, again, not one size fits all. The application vendors will have one perspective. The people responsible for the application store may have a different one. And finally, the brand 
that is linked to the application store might yet again apply different policies. Um, all of that needs to be taken into consideration in order for our technologies to be able to meet those use cases. All right, uh, minimum data data, obviously everybody knows that. I just wanted a place to put the logo of the project. There, done. Um, data management. So uh, Matthew told us this morning, encrypt all the themes. Um, yeah, for sure, that definitely works. Um, I, I'm down with that. Um, however, there is some level of complexity beyond just storing, manipulating, transporting, and sharing the, the data itself. It's like, how is the framework, and that's where I'm starting to talk about app framework, uh, will deal with this. Um, I'll talk about one platform that does some of those things. I know nothing about iOS. I know a tiny bit about Android. Android has that capability where if it wants to wipe part of your data, it can. Um, there is a reason for that, and, and, and we need to be able to provide similar capabilities for others that want to use our frameworks. They want the ability to free storage space and manipulate some of the, the information that's there just because of security purposes, they want a security wipe, they want to do various other functionalities. I don't have all the use cases on the top of my head right now, but some people made interesting casing points for that. So. Um, I, as much as I personally don't necessarily agree with that, sometimes we have to not be completely intransigent and, and be willing to hear use cases that fall a little bit outside of, of our personal beliefs and, and, and adhere to, to what potential people are. So private data deletion is a good example of system-wide removal of information or application specific, uh, dealing with the data with other system components. And I'm not even talking about communicating between one component and another and all that. I'm literally just talking about within the realm of that one user to application pair, the notion that that, that specific user will have a space where they can store. I think that was KDE and Live just trying to load and crashed again. So that, that that's the system version. I don't know why it does that. I haven't had a chance to look at that yet today. Um, so that's another uh, example of places where the, the uh, private data deletion could be a good one. Of course, from the get-go, it's it, those are some of the things I'm talking about now are very obvious. But I just want to remind us that those things are critical, and sometimes they make it a little bit harder. Multi-user support, you know. Yes, of course, we all support that. We I can log five different users in here. I could give you access to my computer and all that. But in, in environments where, where that becomes interesting and the complexity of adding the notion of containers and all that, where do you store that data? Do you, do you determine where that, that data location is? Is there a need for sharing that? How, what are those different environments? Those are the type of user persistency and data persistency use cases which the automotive guys in particular are identifying. If I use the GNV Alliance example for that, they've actually created an entire daemon which you have to call to directly to do all of your I.O. They've literally replaced all of the I.O. layers with their own interfaces for that, and it just goes and drops the files in the right places and, and manipulates all of that. Potentially quite overkill, not necessarily readily used, <laughs> not readily used even by the community. It's just said to be compliant, the daemon is there, and people can use it if they want or not. Um, but that's just one example of, of, of potentially misunderstanding the level of functionalities that are required in a specific environment and the ability to deliver something better, more universal, uh, easier to use, um, that, that I think we can provide to those guys and, and many other industries. Uh, we were just last week in Amsterdam at the International Broadcast Conference, IBC, which is one of the largest trash shows in the world. That's where all of the TV shows are bought and sold. That's where all of the broadcasting live show equipment is bought and sold and so on. And um, there's a huge amount of work that we could do for them from some of those specific use cases as well, because um, they're realizing and they're slowly moving away from very highly specialized SPGA, DSP-based hardware to we can do all of that in the cloud for a fraction of the cost of that hardware that we're buying specialized. So taking the signal out of the trucks where the cameras are connected and sending it somewhere where the data can be processed and broadcasted is completely being revolutionized right now. And they have software application needs uh, more than they've ever had before. And, and I'm, very, uh, I'm very much excited by the potential that that, that that brings. Very much the same thing, this just talks about read-write of specific application environments, talking about uh, private data confidentiality and integrity, um, the changes that can be made or not be made, how other applications can access to 
uh, the first application and so on, the relationship not only from the user's perspective, because I'm logged in as that user and I execute that application as that user, does it give that application the right to uh, write, modify, delete, or use that user privileges to modify data? Um, obviously, the answer may differ from use case to use case. Uh, there are several ways to do that. We've spent ourselves a huge amount of time uh, creating proof of concepts and demonstrations about how powerful and flexible GNU Linux platforms can do that and the extent at which mandatory access control can be optimized to do that. If you're using Fedora, SE Linux is not your enemy. It's something that provides functionalities to you, something that that or other technologies could be embraced to further beyond containerization, sandboxing, and all that give us um, uh, capabilities, uh, control to ca capabilities, and extensions above and beyond that. That would be very good. A quick example of that is uh, we've recently, I think it's been upstream for a while now, but the ability to extend your mandatory access control system and LSM, so li the secure Linux modules integration, to things like the IPC mechanism itself, so DBUS being instrumented so that um, receivers and senders uh, and messages parsing could actually be reviewed, interpreted, and secured uh, through the, the MAC system itself, which, um, again, may seem overkill for a lot of people, but for certain platforms, it makes a lot of sense. If you're going to expose your automotive CAN bus messages on that interface as well, you want to make sure that people that send potential comments on that environment are authorized to do so, and they're who they say they are, and they're controlled that way. So again, uh, 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 secure data and access. So I just said it, but uh, mandatory access to all the things would be one way to do that. It's not necessarily the answer to everything, but the reason I added that slide is I thought of something that you said, where one of the issues about uh, trying to, to determine the security for your systems and environments is a very difficult thing to do. Um, just figuring out everything you need to just create the package to get the application up and running. Make sure you don't leave anything behind. Make sure that no files are not touched. To be able to do that is one aspect. Um, but beyond that, <clears throat> if you actually want to create a security profile for that app, it's not just a matter of exercising or touching that file to get there. It's going beyond that and actually knowing what it's actually used for and how you're interacting with it. So that the level of privileges, the, the level of capabilities that you want for it, and, and so on. Um, it's an interesting challenge. It's something that uh, we've been doing a lot of work on, and ultimately, there are very few people that can do that. If the original application author or authors care enough, they would do that themselves. Interestingly, uh, in one of the projects we work on, which is the Apertis effort uh, led by, by Bosch, um, which is a GNOME-based, it uses a ton of GNOME technologies solution, there, uh, there is a requirement in the developer experience where I know it's not great, but then there's an Eclipse plugin. You, you use that as part of a virtual machine and all that. And when you start writing your app, you can't even compile it locally to use it locally without you starting to create your mandatory access control profile for your app. So that the end result is that when you're ready to publish it and have other people experience your application, the security components and the dependencies and the various elements of your application are understood by the Mac system. So that's a, a quick example of that, which is uh, which you could take a look at. Um, I have one more example before I talk about uh, another area, which is the needs for uh, other services to potentially be integrated. And this is one that's very current for us, which is the notion of uh, QoS in systems where one of the uh, driving around in cars that you're actually driving in car, around in cars and then the data connectivity is unreliable that can be reproduced in other environments where I, I've been taking quite a bit of trains in Europe lately and uh, you have the same problem there. The, the connection is really not reliable at all, whether it's the train Wi-Fi or it's LTE or 3G connections that you have. Above and beyond that, if you're crossing borders, there are roaming implications that you have to take into account as well. So all of that needs to be understood and factored in into your connectivity layer. So you can't just think that Network Manager is good enough. I just use Network Manager. All users that ever use my app use Network Manager, and I'm good to go. Not so much. Uh, like I said, whether it's that medical device that's always sitting by the side of a bed or it's a car, uh, there are other interfaces uh, by which and by uh, that, that those services and apps will be exposed. So for that reason, uh, we think that providing notions of QoS, I'm using networking as an example there, you can see 
This is uh, taken from a, a very dumb uh, QoS Docker paper that was written by the University of Delaware, where they're just showing how using simple uh, Linux TC uh, traffic control, they can take their Linux containers, whatever technology that might have been, and they can control the traffic there. You, you probably will need that in some app framework to be able to do this uh, in various environments. So just something to keep in mind, uh, because the, 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 it's on that next slide. The departure from just having applications being delivered and pushed through an app store and all that, and starting to think about some people have needs where they will need an app framework, and I'm putting that in big quotes, right? Um, to be able to deliver that exists. Um, if you're a healthcare medical company, you are very strict about what goes on the platform, and any given application can come in and just say, I want that extra library or two, or I have this extra. So it, these environments are quite strict. And also, uh, the automotive environment is that as well. So if you have some questions, we have some people get, that can talk beyond that um, uh, uh, about that. So another example uh, I wanted to bring up, and I'm going to need a little bit of help for that, because I wanted to close on something a little bit more concrete. Um, that's a Steam controller, uh, and uh, Valve SteamOS uh, is a potential platform that could be of interest for some of you guys. So two slides of 30 seconds context so that everybody understands the distinctions. Valve SteamOS is a Debian derivative. It's a Linux distribution which uses app repositories to do its system updates and installations. That's how it delivers all the components. Uh, it's, it's staying up to date. They're doing improvements both from a security and performance perspective. Um, and most importantly, from a user's perspective, it comes with the Steam application and the Steam runtime pre-installed, okay? So Steam OS is the Debian derivative Linux distribution, and Steam applications, Steam runtimes are the Valve software that are delivered to do that. More interestingly, when we're talking about that here, the Steam runtime and app are cross-platform applications. They've been running on Windows, obviously, for a long time, Mac OS, and Linux as well. <clears throat> One of the things that the runtime gives you on Linux is that it gives the developers of the games a guarantee of a platform that will continue to run. It's enabling them to do that. They are about four years ahead of us. The runtime itself is specced on an older version of Ubuntu with a lot of improvements. But that sort of gives you the idea of that, uh, that environment in which the games are running. Okay, So that's SteamOS, Steam Runtime. Uh, the distinction. Um, the tool chain has been updated, a bunch of the libraries, so GCC, LibC, and so on, are, are, are newer um, than that. But effectively, what, what they're telling users, I hope I'm right, is that the 12.04 is sort of the platform by which they're, they're doing that. And there are a bunch of reasons for that. I'll just illustrate it very quickly. Whether you, uh, you have a composite interface or, or, or a parental, whatever data interface you can do to your TV, an Atari 2600 still runs today. If you bought those games, if you have that console, you can still play them right now. It's more about the notion of being able to entertain yourself, but it's also the notion that the game developer and the consumer have a way to get that content and being able to play it. Okay? So that's a, an interesting example of that. And the perimeter and the ability to continue to use that is, is an interesting element. So to be able to deal with some of that, you want to use as little of the system as possible. It's not because Valve doesn't like the system. They, they trust, effectively, the work that Debian or Ubuntu or other people have done because the runtime runs on other platforms. That's not the point. The point is that they need to be able to provide something to the game developers that they can continue to trust will be there and use in order to achieve that. So there are very simple mechanisms that exist that have been there for a long time that enables us to do that. You're separating out the paths, and you're, you're relocating libraries, and you're creating environments that make it so that it's easy to do so. As a result, uh, bubble wrap may be a, a really good way to eliminate some of the specificities of the environment there and, and do that using that, which is really good. And, and, and they are very thankful for that. Um, but that's the easy part. Now I want to talk about something that hasn't really been solved and something that could be discussed beyond that. Certainly not with me. <laughs> um, you guys talked about portals. I'm not going to pretend I know the details around it, but I get the idea that people need access to sell. People need access to sell. They need to be able to push graphics. They need to be able to d 3 d They need the network access. They need peripheral access. They need all of that stuff. 
sounds great on paper. I'm sure it's a significant challenge to do very well. And I'll give you one example of somebody that's been struggling with that for quite a long time. <clears throat> Last time I checked, video games require you to have good graphics performance. Right? Um, that's not easy to do. Um, if, you got, if you want the, the right graphics drivers for your hardware and you want to drive that fast, you're going to need newer versions of the software. In order to have newer versions of the software, because you don't control that stack, you're going to have newer versions of the dependencies. And because of that, you need a dedicated graphics driver, you need newer hardware, you need all of that fun stuff. You guys know where I'm going with this. I'll give you a concrete example that was provided to me by, by Valve and, and our team. Um, if your game is developed in C++, you need to be able to use the, the, the binaries and the libraries for you to do that. Obviously, you can't have both of those in your path, otherwise bad things happen. So, if your system looks like this, which is sort of what we're suggesting everything would look like moving forward if you have environments like that, you're not going to get very far to get your games running with a newer version of a graphic stack because the game's not going to work and then you defeat the purpose to begin with. That's a pretty hard challenge to solve. Um, the guys have looked at some various options to do that. First of all would be to statically link a bunch of things around and because in that particular case they control the platform, they would have a way to do that. Uh, it's not very universal though, it makes it quite difficult to work across multiple um, distributions very well and, and, and control it um, in a flexible manner, but it does work. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the graphics people don't really like that. I can understand why. Uh, it's not ideal and it's unlikely that people will adopt that moving forward. There are other options that are being explored. Uh, you could just stub functions, create an abstraction layer, uh, and, and invoke things like DLM open um, to deal with that, which will give you private namespaces to achieve that. Um, is it going to work all the way? Are we going to run into corner cases? Um, most likely, uh, very likely. Uh, but again, this, this is just a, um, from, like I said, two speed, all the way to some of the challenges that we're facing today that the, the guys are trying to resolve that as a community we're going to run into, uh, which I don't have an answer for. Uh, and I invite all of you to work together to, to, to uh, achieve that because they are commercial companies that are leveraging the free desk stuff and the GNOME technologies that are looking forward to deliver great user experiences to people. And in order to do that, we need to make sure that we, one, carry our message as wide and loud as we can. You have my word, I'm trying to do that with my understanding of the technologies and our ability to reuse that in environments like the automotive uh, industry and, and, uh, and other verticals as well. And um, yes, that's it. I want to thank you all so very much, not for listening to me, but for being here uh, and for all the work that you're doing. Uh, it's tremendous. If you're consuming the technology or you're creating the technology, it's, it's all good. And uh, if there are any questions, we have people from Valve, we have people from Collabora, and I can't answer any questions, but I'll take them and direct them to the right people. <laughs> I guess basically we have the same problem in Platform with the OpenGL library, and I'm just wondering, do you actually have people working on the DLM open solution? And if so, <laughs> I'd like to like hack. It's like the solution solution we have right now in Platform is to build a extension containing the GL like for a particular runtime, but that's not like a long-term solution because you have to build runtimes for everything. Yeah, and 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 I would like to automatically break a runtime based on the host OS thing. But I like to like keep in touch on yeah, how sure that right. is <laughs> working out because I do really it's like that. Really this whole highly experimental yeah. Yeah. step, step one. Uh, but, it, but if we need use. like particular features in yeah. in, in the libc it says maybe we can push them mm -hmm. into the free desktop runtime yeah. and then we can kind of do the same thing with that back. Really the problem is the, the approach things have the dependency of each in yeah. the application, and it's a matter of being disciplined about growing a boundary yeah. to the stage that hasn't really ever been enforced anywhere. So as you get to more container technologies, whether you're using GL or Vulkan or whatever, you're using. Have you ever looked at like 
relinking stuff, like loading the L file and modifying the oh, symbol. Oh, like, yeah. Uh, you said we have a solution to stack it like the Mesa. And oh, yeah, yeah, and we actually do that in Fedora on this base. But yeah, I mean, th that's at compile level, you build it. But I mean, actually, like, taking to pre pre build SO files and, like, renaming the functions in them and manually applying version, simple versioning to avoid common uh, We have, we have two far down that road. So we're at.